great. Thank you so much. So we are uh, <laughs> we're in Philippians chapter 4, coming to the end of that letter from Paul to the church in Philippi, obviously. And uh, chapter 3 really left us with an emphasis on living with the mind of Christ. Back in chapter 2, he'd written, you have this mind in you which is already yours in Christ Jesus. Uh, and then chapter 3 expanded on that some more, uh, talking about his goal was to press on, to try to become more Christ-like. And that's really the goal for all of us. Uh, God says, for instance, through Paul in, in Romans chapter 8, that he's at work working things together for the good of those who love him. But he's doing it with the end game, with the goal of transforming us, shaping us, molding us into the image of Christ his son, to be more Christ-like. And that was Paul's goal in Philippians 3 as well. In verse 10 he said he, his goal is to become like Jesus even in his sufferings. Uh, and, and what was that like? Well, what Jesus was like even in his sufferings was he uh, um, explicitly pursued his Father's will. And that's to be the goal, the Christ-likeness that God's trying to recreate in each one of us. And I want to use the word recreate there because that was God's intent in creating human beings in the first place, that we would have that image. Remember, it talks in Genesis about being created in the image of God. And what that's talking about there isn't, isn't you know, appearance or anything physical like that. It's talking about that relationship that Jesus prayed about in the Gospels, for instance, especially in John 16 and 17, when he prays for believers of all time, that we would share in that image and that oneness that he and the Spirit have with the Father. So why is that an important thing to think about? Well, just think of what that oneness entails for a minute. Just go through that logically in your mind. To be one in that incredibly all-encompassing, nothing left out, intimate sense would be for lack of a better phrase, to be perfectly at home, to be perfectly at rest. This is where I belong, it's where I was made to be. And so what God's trying to do in recreating that image of Christ in us, and you know, like Romans 12 talks about, that happens as our minds are renewed through the Word of God, He's trying to recreate that oneness in you and me again. And that oneness, as it grows, leads to greater unity among the people of God as well. Because now, for each one of us, we are not at the center of all things, but God is there, and that's where He belongs. And it's when we're relating to Him in that way. And this isn't God going on a power trip. This isn't God saying, I'm in charge, you guys, you're, you're under my thumb. This is God helping us fit into His creation the way we were intended to. So that you and I don't have to be uh, like people who are like a, a square peg trying to fit into a round hole. God reveals to us how we fit into His creation. So becoming like Christ, uh, sharing in that oneness, pursuing the Father's will, having Him at the center, ourselves removed more and more from the center, God put there, in the end, that leads to us leaving, leading rather a life of real blessing as well. So again, God's goal is to make us more Christ-like, where we're not living for God, as though we're here and God's there and we're trying to do things for Him. That almost inevitably, not always, but almost inevitably leads to us performance thinking ourselves. I haven't lived for Him well enough. I feel guilty. I don't. Well, what God wants to do is take away those elements of separation. He wants to take away the element of us feeling guilty about it. And so we're not living for God, but because of who He is. Big, big difference. Because He is faithful and unchanging. So when that kind of thinking, when that kind of, uh, what what's the word rejoice mean as we've been looking at it in Philippians? That kind of calm, gratitude, peaceful disposition, uh, a calmness about us that, that knows that we're held and everything is okay, when that doesn't resonate with us, it's time for us to stop and ask ourselves, you know, to use Jesus' terminology from the Gospel of John, are we recognizing the truth? Are we recognizing reality? 
what God says is reality for you and me. And that is that he is faithful, that he has not disappeared, that he has worked out his plan of salvation in spite of the human race, that he remains ultimately and completely faithful to us and now calls us to follow him without fear, but because we get to, because of who he is, because for lack of a, a better way of putting it, we want to be with our daddy, our perfect father. Uh, and, and again, Jesus told and taught us to pray, Abba, Father, which in Aramaic is daddy. That's what a two-year-old calls their father when they trust that, that person more than anything and before they realize that we as human fathers are imperfect. But our heavenly father's not imperfect. Okay. So all of that was kind of chapter three, and that led us to the end of that chapter where the ultimate goal in contrasting what it's like to live for the short term, you know, what we get out of this life, a few decades, and then that's it, and instead replace that with pressing on toward the eternal perspective, where it reminded us at the end of chapter three, our citizenship in verse 20 is in heaven. And we're eagerly awaiting a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, what is that power? Well, the power of his, again, lack of a better word, his completed task, his successful mission. He did what God planned for him to do. And therefore, all authority is his, like last Sunday's gospel reading said. Everything is under him. So by that power um, enables him to bring everything under his control and ultimately he will transform our lowly, sinful uh, human bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. We will be completed. We will be what God intended us to be as we live with him in eternity. So that's our future. And that's why chapter 4 where we begin today begins with a therefore. But the therefore is based on everything I was just talking about, the absolute confidence that God who does not change has said, this is true and this is where I want to bring you to be. Okay? So if that's true, Paul's going to kind of lead us through the thinking. If that's true, then what are you going to do with that? How are you going to respond to that? How does that impact your life? And that's chapter 4. So let's begin with prayer. Lord God, we thank you that you are here today with us. We thank you because of who you are, uh, unchanging, unrelenting in your desire to bring people like us back from our separation from you, to know you for who you are as you've shown yourself in Jesus, your son. So help us to live by that faith now and to live uh, with the kind of uh, gratitude and peace and, and calmness that comes from knowing you. We pray all of this that we would also uh, give honor and glory to you, and we ask it in our Savior's name. Amen. All right, so the therefore again in chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, you who, sorry, therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. And that's why I went through that long review, because chapter 4 just points you right back at it. So how do you stand firm? You remember God's reality. You keep going back to that reality, who God is, what he's like, what he's done for you and me, the fact that he will not fail you, and then you and I strive to be, again, lack of a better way of putting it, part of that reality. Uh, when I pray in the Lord's Prayer to God, your kingdom come, is his kingdom going to come whether I ask for it or not, little old me? You betcha. So what am I praying for? That I'd be a part of it. And that's the same idea here. The reality of who God is, we want that to be a part of us. And that's how we stand firm, by living in that truth, in that reality. Uh, so he gives some examples of what that looks like in the verses that follow. Um, let's just uh, go through a little bit here. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. And that's all he says about those two. Euodia and Syntyche. Uh, two not very common names from, you know, biblical names. Sometimes people continue on with them, sometimes they don't. It got me thinking today. And, and I don't really know what to make of this because I just kind of did the work on it this morning. Uh, Euodia means fine traveler. That's a pretty good name. 
uh, for, for someone to give their daughter, right? Fine traveler. You're going to have a, you're going to journey through this life in a way that gives thanks and honors to God from a Christian perspective. Syntyche means accident. <laughs> I'm kind of glad that isn't a name many people give their daughters these days, right? Uh, so, you know, I don't know what was in her background, but, you know, it, it maybe does say something about how the grace of God would impact someone who had been given a name like that. And remember, in that culture, names really carried a lot of freight. Uh, and, you know, it, I think it's hard for us to wrap our minds around sometimes. But children, while they were valued, were also a bit of a commodity culturally, especially the girls in that culture. And, and so, you know, Syntyche, with a name like that and being a young woman in that culture, might have had a pretty rough upbringing. Uh, you know, just reading between the lines. Don't know it for a fact, but I think it's a pretty solid guess. So here she is now, knowing that Jesus has valued her enough to suffer hell for her. What a change that would make in her life, if she did especially have that kind of a background. So Paul is pleading with these two, uh, and that word pleading is, is kind of invoking or pleading's a good word, really. Uh, he, he's just saying, I mentioned the word invoke because it kind of has a little bit of a command aspect to it. You know, I, I'm invoking you uh, to, to do what's right. And there is that element to it, and that's worth thinking about because he does have the right, Paul does have the right to say that, because what Paul is saying is for them to follow who? Paul or Jesus? Jesus. So he's got the right to be a little bit more heavy-handed about it, but I think plead is a good word because it's a relational word. It's not a command word. Uh, and, and so what he's saying is, Euodia, Syntyche, agree with each other, and that last phrase is important, in the Lord. Almost invariably, especially in Paul's letters, that phrase, in Jesus or in the Lord, he's almost invariably calling to mind the fact that you're God's child in your, in, in your faith and in your baptism. And, and so that kind of makes sense here too, right? Yodia, Syntyche, you are children of God, you are sisters in the Lord, therefore act like it, is really what it's boiling down to, isn't it? Yeah, Gail. I think too, it's saying set yourselves aside. When we say in the Lord, yeah. this isn't about self-centered, it is about being Christ-centered. So even if you guys don't like it, do it for the sake of Jesus. Okay, and that goes right back to what we were talking about in the introductory section, right? My goal is to be more like Jesus, even in his sufferings. I'm pressing on toward that. I don't feel like I've taken hold of it perfectly yet, says Paul in chapter 3. And, and in fact, if you, you know more of Paul's writings, like Romans 7, it's clear that he knows he hasn't. You know, what I, what I don't want to do, I see myself doing. What I don't want to do, I, I do anyway. And who will rescue me? Well, thanks be to God through Jesus, is his answer. And, and that same kind of gospel motivation keeps pouring Jesus into the center of the picture again. And that's what he's trying to do with Euodia and Syntyche. So, uh, I had a sister. I shouldn't say that in past tense. I have a sister. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're both adults now and we're, we're long past being young adults. And I can remember lots of fun times we had together and lots of times we butted heads. And I can remember my parents having to talk to both of us at different times, especially my sister, if you're watching this, Brenda. Um, <clears throat> sometimes she does. Uh, and and uh, reminding us that we're family. And that's really what he's doing here again, isn't it? In a culture like ours, where everyone's pretty private and independent, and it, it, it's a good reminder, isn't it? We actually are family here. And so let's practice those Jesus-like family values. Okay, so there's example number one. Agree with each other in the Lord, and yet you nailed it. Jesus belongs at the center, not either one of you. Okay, and then going on. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, to help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Uh, you may have a footnote there for loyal yoke fellow. 
Uh, it, it was also a common uh, first name. And if you have a footnote, you'll see that it's an almost impossible to pronounce in English first name. S-Y-Z-G-U-S, Sisgus. Again, not a very common one in, in our culture, right? But the word Sisgus, which was a common name, literally means yoke fellow. And I think NIV did a good job of leaving that word in the text here. Because when, let's just take that word apart a little bit. When two oxen, for example, for all us city folks, let's get the picture together. When two oxen are yoked together, and whichever of those two oxen is the stronger of the two or the, the dominant of the two goes in this direction, where's the other one going to go? The same direction, right? And, and that's the idea behind this too that really fits Euodia, Syntyche, you know, help them to move in the same direction. And so Paul's not just talking to the two people who are directly involved, it seems, in whatever the little bit of headbutting's about, but he's talking to others in the Christian community that know them and that with whom they have a relationship and saying, you know, help them out with this. Help them remember whose they are. And I think that's just a, a really valuable insight for people like us. I remember uh, coming across a, a sermon example once kind of resonated with me. You know, this, this dad's child is going off to leave home and go away for the first time, to live elsewhere. And he's trying to think, because, you know, you're supposed to have fatherly words of wisdom, and most of us don't have too many. But he's trying to think, what am I going to say as, as, you know, son or daughter moves out on their own the first time? And what he finally comes up with is way wiser than anything I would have come up with. What he finally comes up with is, remember whose child you are. What does that mean in a human sense? Remember what we taught you. Remember what your family's about. Remember, uh, you know, how you learned what matters in this world and the place that people have in that. Well, if that's what a human family's, what, uh, lessons for living to send someone out into the future involve, how much more the Christian family? So that's the idea behind what Paul's saying here. And remember where this all began. Because of who Jesus is. Because he is real and does not change. And I, I'm going to keep saying that today. Because too often, lessons like this for Christian people become, oh yeah, we're Christians, I guess I should try harder. I'm not against trying. But what I really want to get at is why. Because too many of us try from a starting point of, I haven't done good enough and I feel guilty about it. The second you rec recognize, let me talk about me again. The second I recognize I haven't done good enough, which happens a lot, the most beautiful thing I can remember is Jesus on the cross looking me in the eye and saying, that's exactly why I'm here, Mark. And that's what he says to you. And so that takes the fear away. And again, we're gifted then with what Jesus commended, childlike faith. And what's a child's faith in their parents like when they're, you know, four years old, three years old? They don't know where the next meal is going to come from. They don't know what makes the lights go on in the house in the morning, you know, to use our Western culture. They, they don't know how they're going to get to where they need to go that day and who's going to put gas in the vehicle or get them on transit or whatever it might be. But they trust they're going to get there because they've got a mom or a dad that's looking after it. They're not questioning how or why, they're trusting that it is. Huh. Not living for God, but because He is because of who he is, okay? Big, big, important distinction. So, um, loyal yoke fellow, uh, Sisgus is called into the equation as well, and the goal for him is to remember who they are. Notice that? That's where Paul goes to. Don't, don't let them have it with both barrels, but remind them who they are. You know, they've contended for the gospel. Remind them of what really matters in their life. And, and they haven't been alone in this. And, and maybe Clement could be pulled in then as well. Maybe that's why he's mentioned there as well. But their names, all of your names are in the book of life. That's what matters. Because anything else is a blip 
on the timeline of eternity, isn't it? But eternity is yours. That's who God is. That's what he's given you, okay? Keeps coming back to that. And then rejoice in the Lord always in verse 4. Have calm delight in the Lord. That's always what that word rejoice comes back to. And, and I really like that phrasing, calm delight, to take it away from the ups and downs of super happy mountaintop experience and then the valley comes. And almost inevitably there's valleys, right? We've all experienced them. But can you have calm delight even in the valleys? That's where Paul's going with this. So rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. How? Well, let your gentleness be evident to all. Gentleness, um, there's, there's a great phrase that is the literal meaning of that word. Sweet reasonableness. Sweet reasonableness. Let your sweet reasonableness be evident to all. Now I'm going to look in the mirror at my life for a minute and ask myself, has sweet reasonableness always been evident to the people I interact with? Not always. But I'm a sinner and you're a sinner. And that remains my goal. And how much better off am I, going to use the words I was using at the beginning, when I recognize God's reality that that's what he wants me to aim for and that's what he's aiming for in me. That I would have sweet reasonableness with the people I deal with. And I'll let you figure out what that means in your life. I know just a couple of examples of what it might mean in mine. It might mean taking a deep breath and sleeping on it. And then get back to that situation tomorrow after I talk to God about it in prayer and let his word feed me a little bit. It'd be so much more fun just to react right now. <laughs> but that probably wouldn't do as much good. And you know, that's just one example. Um, sweet reasonableness would also take me out of the center of the equation and recognize reality and put who in the center again, or at least try to, Christ, right? And when he's at the center, boy, is it ever easier to take a deep breath and say, okay, we can work with that because, you know, Jesus is actually leading and guiding us all. And okay, we can work with that. It becomes a lot easier to be reasonable when you remember whose you are. Okay. So let that be evident to all, it says. And I lost my place here. Oh, yeah. Verse 5. Let that be evident to all. And the word evident there has an element of experiencing it that experiential knowledge that we talk about in, in the New Testament, that's also connected to that word evident. So let them experience sweet reasonableness through you. Man, just think about it in theory, okay? If a group of people, no matter what the size of group, got together and every one of them was, was holding forth the goal of having sweet reasonableness that all the rest of the group and those outside could experience, would that be a group that would be attractive to other people? I kind of think so. Yeah, you know, as opposed to what we often experience from day-to-day -day life, right? And are often guilty of as well, okay? Um, <clears throat> all right, so, and then he goes uh, back again to, to how this, uh, what's behind all this? Uh, the Lord is near. That's the reality. That's God's reality. Does that ever change? That never changes. And that's why I said a while ago, you know, when, when these kinds of thoughts just aren't resonating with me, and I think sweet reasonableness is about 10 million miles away, invariably, God's gone nowhere. But I've kind of wandered. I've kind of drifted. And I need to have a heart and a mind renewed by the gospel again. And that's why that becomes such an ongoing theme. Let the, the word keep renewing your mind. And, and just think about it for a minute. Because, okay, let's say <laughs> you're here for about an hour a week in a Bible study group. Let's say this is the only input you ever have from God's word. Just do the math and figure out how many other hours there are in the week. And, and what kind of input are you receiving the rest of the time if this is the only input you have, okay? 
uh, and I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on anybody when I say that. I'm just trying to make an example. There's stuff coming at us all the time. And, and garbage in, garbage out. So let's make sure it's not garbage only that's going in. <laughs> but that's what Paul dealt with in, in chapter 3, that a lot of people live just pursuing stuff that doesn't last. And he considered that chapter 2. Nothing compared to knowing Jesus, because that lasts forever. Okay. All right, so, um, so the Lord is near becomes a great motivator for all this. And then verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. Okay, you feeling guilty now? I'm good at anxious. Are you good at anxious? Well, some of you aren't, and I'm jealous now. So now I'm anxious and I'm jealous. Thanks a lot. No. <laughs> the, the point is, if you ever feel anxious, don't say, oh, I'm such a terrible Christian. Jesus taught his disciples, Matthew chapter 6, do not worry about tomorrow. Why did Jesus say that to his disciples? Explicitly because they worried about tomorrow. And so he shared with them why you don't have to. And what it boiled down to and what Jesus says in Matthew 6, and you can read it for yourself, is the Lord is near. That's a great summary of what Jesus says in Matthew 6. So when you're anxious, don't just feel guilty and think, I'm a terrible person, I better try harder. What does Paul say? He says, when you're anxious, don't just be anxious, but in everything, even when you're anxious, in other words, by prayer and petition with, oh, that's an important one, thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Is there anything wrong with the prayer, oh God, please help? No, nothing wrong with that. But should my prayer be more than that at times? Of course. It should be a conversation with God that comes out of what His Word says to me. And, and when I'm struggling with things in His Word, I can talk to Him about that. And when I think, I, I, I really don't know if I can do that one, Lord, and, and I don't really think you're being fair there. And, and He's going to help me work that through, and I don't think He's being fair. And, you know, all of that's a give and take, right? And it's much more than, oh, God, please help. Now, when you're driving down Deerfoot, <laughs> pray without ceasing. <laughs> and you glance this way to check to shoulder check before changing a lane and look back forward and the vehicle in front of you has stopped dead and you slam on the brakes and in your head you say please God help there's nothing wrong with that prayer right that's not the time to say oh Lord you are great and kind your mercy is without ending I have a little bit of praise to give to you now and oh by the way would you please God gets it that's not what we're talking about but what we're talking about is, is just the general stuff from day to day. So when we're anxious especially, when we're doubting, take the word anxious out, put in doubting. Uh, when we're fearful, take the word anxious out, put in fearful. When we're filled with self and pride, take the word anxious out and put that in. When we're struggling with anything that we're kind of thinking isn't that God-pleasing, what do we do? Well, present your requests to God. Sorry, I, I jumped ahead. Uh, by prayer, that's a conversation with God. That's what the word literally means, a conversation. And petition, what's that? A petition is when you're asking for something, right? If, if you sign a petition, you're asking someone to make some change or something like that. So by conversation and request with, never forget that one, thanksgiving present your requests to God. And again, we're not talking about the emergency break on the freeway here. We're talking about prayer in general. I've had to discipline myself to always include thanksgiving. And I cannot tell you how much better my understanding of who God is, the peace inside of me, my prayer life, everything in, about me is when I remember who God is, because then I know I've got reason to be thankful. You are amazing. You are powerful. And you know, a lot of you know, I get into all these things from the world around us and from science that, you know why? Because it shows me how amazing God is. Um, I won't go down that rabbit hole today. 
But there are things I'll look at and, and, and I see a glimpse of the mind of Almighty God. And it just makes you go, wow. Um, Mandelbrot set is one of them. I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole. I want to, but I'm not going to. And, and the, the Mandelbrot set is, is, this is, some people are just going to tune out right now. But it's got to do with how numbers work. And ask yourself this. We all take for granted that 2 plus 2 equals 4, right? Why? Why should it? And, and why should it halfway across the universe from here? Why? We know it does and we assume it does, but why? If everything is a cosmic a accident, where did these incredibly precise laws of nature come from that make everything exist? And the Mandelbrot sets an example of that, where it shows you how numbers work in a way it's only been, been, been able to, to be described within the last 20 years because the computer processing power wasn't high enough before that to, just, to, to map out these sets. But it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful how it repeats itself over and over and over and you can go infinitesimally smaller and smaller and smaller and what do you see? You see the same set in all its beauty appearing over again and when it's depicted graphically it's absolutely gorgeous. It's, it's like a, a work of art. It's a glimpse of the mind of God. And, and we're in a universe that, that displays his splendor all around us. Okay, I went down the rabbit hole a bit, but well, now I'm backing out again. Too, because the gematria of the Hebrew language, that same science, we'll call it, is in every letter here doing the same thing. Sure. It's amazing. And there's real design behind all of this. And so, you know, uh, I, when I say then, do not be anxious, back in the text, Back out of the rabbit hole, back to the word. Uh, do not be anxious about anything. What helps me personally more and more and more with that is remembering who God is because that invariably leads to thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And then you know. I'm trying to think of a good example. Just imagine the biggest, toughest person you can possibly imagine. Would you want them by your side when you're walking into the most dangerous place of your life? You know, I got someone bigger than that with me always. Mm -hmm. And no matter what happens, where's he taking me to be with him forever? Okay. So that, that helps with the anxiousness, remembering the character and nature of God. And then I'm ready to ask. Then the petition can come. He says, now I'm asking someone who... I'm old enough to be a little cynical. You know, when I have a problem with something... Uh, I had a problem with, with something at the house last week. And so you get on the phone to the, the people who installed it and start talking to them and <laughs> you guys don't care. <laughs> you guys are real, I'm not going to name names or anything. Mm -hmm. But it's tempting to think that way about everything, right? Because we've experienced so much of that. That never applies to God. And, and so it takes us away from that and the petitions then really have value and they lead to thanksgiving. And what's the result? Then we present our request to God and, verse 7, the natural outcome, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And that word guard has the idea of a sentinel standing watch behind it. The peace of God, because of who He is, guards you. And are you still going to have to face the hard things? Yeah. Probably. Uh, you know, God will answer some prayers miraculously sometimes, but, but a lot of times that, that phrase, Jesus spoke in this world, you will have trouble, is our experience. But what did he go on to say? But be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. And that's the peace that passes human understanding in the middle of the struggle. Um, personal example? Maybe it resonates with you, maybe it doesn't. It might, because here, I've heard this said. The two greatest fears of people in North America, and this has been pretty consistent in my reading over the last 30, 40 years, are public speaking and death. <laughs> so if you're going to be at a funeral, that tells me you'd be happier to be the person in the casket than the one leading the service. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, but 
I, I'm a very introverted person. You might find that hard to believe, but to do what I'm doing right now, I find it exhausting mentally. Very introverted. Very shy. And yet I, I felt this inclination and my friends supported the inclination that said, I think God would like you to be in ministry. And you know what, what just scared the life out of me? Things like this and things like preaching and being in front of people. And what, what changes that? Well, knowing two important things. This isn't about me, it's about the living God. And he's right there. And the power's with him, not with me. And so I can just say the truth. And then if I mess that up or don't say it quite right, one of you guys will call me out on it and we'll get it straightened out. And we'll do it in a way that's, that's loving and concern-filled and all the rest of it. And, and now where's the emphasis put? It's not on me anymore. And so that helps. That's the peace of God in that situation for me. Because it's about Him, not about me anymore. So whatever your difficult situation is, and every one of us is going to have them in our callings and in our vocations and in our lives with families and friends and work and school and whatever it might be, remember the character of God. That's what Philippians is really about. And that leads to a calm delight. Rejoice. Okay? Peace of God that transcends, it's literally above all understanding. It's not logical. It doesn't necessarily make logical sense, but it's real nonetheless. And that is a sentinel that guards you. And when I say it may not make logical sense, all I mean is, I'll use my tired example. If I only sin in thought, word, and deed once a day, I'm doing way better than anybody else on earth. But still, at my age, that's around 20,000 offenses against God. Logically, he should want nothing to do with me. And don't kid yourself. Every person on this planet, no matter who they are, from the most powerful and wealthiest and most affluent to the lowest of the low, is desperately insecure somewhere inside and thinks that if everybody else really knew the very core of me, they'd probably reject me. And our minds play games with us then and tell us that God's the same. All of this short circuits that thinking, that, that, that falsehood and replaces it with God's reality in Jesus. That you are carved on the palm of his hand, he says in Isaiah. So that's the peace of God that guards you and acts as a sentinel. And notice again, it's the same phrasing. Guards your hearts and minds where? End of verse uh, 7, in Christ Jesus. So Euodia, Syntyche agree with each other in the Lord. He's at the center. The peace guards you in Christ Jesus when he's at the center. That's always what it comes back to. And remember, that involves who God is. I'm living because of him not necessarily just for him. I want to live for him, but, but only because of who he is. And that takes the fear away. And finally then, uh, verse 8, Brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Is that just positive thinking? It's more than that in this context. If you just took verse 8 out of context, and put it on a placard somewhere and hung it on someone's wall, it could just be positive thinking. But let's put it back where it came from. And in this setting, what's Paul getting at? He's getting at thinking of the things of God. I mean, what is true? God is. Whatever, or yeah, whatever is noble, well, God is. And you could go through the whole list. And it applies to God as he's revealed himself to us in Jesus' Son most clearly. Think about such things. And then it's more than positive thinking, but it's one more time. Are you tired of me saying this? Going back to who God is. That's what he's saying in verse 8 again. Go back to who God is. Finally, keep on doing that. And it's more than positive thinking. There is a passage in the Bible that says you reap what you sow. And often people use that in a very negative sense, right? And, and I kind of get it. You know, you, 
you treat everybody else like dirt, you're probably going to get treated like dirt sometimes in response. But what about in the positive sense? If you follow verse 8, and that's what you're sowing, you're going to start reaping some real positive things out of that too. You'll know the, the connectedness with God that we all long for more, more and more clearly. So Paul goes on in 9 then to say, Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. You know, not just talk. Take a step of faith. And that's such a critical part of this. And it's so often where we fall short, isn't it? I know it's true. I know it's true. I know it's true. And God, I'm going to act on it tomorrow. <laughs> and when tomorrow comes, I'm going to act on it tomorrow. And that's one of Satan's great deceptions is there's always tomorrow and we don't know if there will be. So put it into practice now. Take that step of faith and the Father's heart is glad. And because of who he is, does he look the other way and ignore that? No. He responds. And you start to fit. And this For me again, it just fits my way of thinking. You and I then start to fit into his creation the way we were intended to. And if you imagine being a round peg, someone's trying to pound into a square hole, that wouldn't feel very good, would it? Instead, we just fit right in the way God intended us to more and more. And that's the idea behind putting it into practice. And the result, at the end of verse 9, and the God of peace might be with you, will be with you. No doubt about it. Again, that's reality. That's the truth that sets you free. And I just love connecting those two words. The reality is, as you and I live by faith, the God of peace will be with you. Okay, um, Okay. Paul gives some personal examples to kind of wrap up the book of Philippians. I rejoice, I have calm delight greatly in the Lord. Uh, you know, because of who God is, I, I'm grateful to God. I want to give glory to Him. Why? Well, look at what He's done that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Now, it's not that Paul was um, having hard feelings toward the church at Philippi. You know, he, he's a realist. He recognizes that they're doing their best to help him in any way they can. But Paul's also a human being, and, and isn't it great when people that you know, love, and trust express their good wishes to you, but then do it in ways that are real as well, that are tangible. You know, they actually show up. Both are important, aren't they? And so Paul's recognizing that here as well. And, you know, that's good for us to remember too, that it is important for us to, to actually put this into practice and to show up. That's part of the step of faith. Uh, but, you know, he's, he's not calling them out. You had no opportunity to show it, but it sure is great that God allowed it now, is the idea behind it. And what a blessing to me. And isn't it great to know that God has made you a blessing to someone else too? And, and that's, again, part of that relationship, that unity that, that he's working us towards here. He goes on to explain in verse 11, I'm not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content or satisfied, whatever the circumstances. Example, I know what it is to be in need. Uh, and the word there literally means humiliated to the greatest degree. I know what it is to be right at the bottom. Uh, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret, however, of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. What is it? Verse 13. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That's what empowers me. And who's the him who gives me strength? It's that same God, that same Lord, the one who's changed, or sorry, whose character is unchanging. You know, remember when Moses was all afraid to go to Pharaoh and can you blame him? You know, Moses who was the murderer who'd run away from Pharaoh's court years before and now God's calling him to go back and say to Pharaoh, the the superpower leader of the world, let my people go. And Moses says, really? Me? What, what, what will I say if, if the people that you're asking me to go to even ask who am I? And God said, tell them who I am. I am. I do not change. I've sent you. And, and that's the same God who's speaking here as he says through Paul, it's my strength that matters in verse 13. Uh, and that strength then, where does it come from? comes from the Word. 
It comes from a heart and mind that are rooted in that word. It comes from that helping us to see over and over the reality of who God is, that he doesn't change, that his character is unassailable. And then in our own sinful human way, our in sinful human nature, struggling to keep him at the center. It's always a struggle, right? Do you like being at the center yourself? Yeah, it's kind of nice there sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but when, when Christ is at the center, how much better things are. Uh, and that's not to say we don't matter, right? Because the one who's being put at the center is the one who said we mattered so much that he suffered hell for us. You know, he's, he's got our best interests at heart. Uh, so it's his strength and the reality of who he is. Nothing magical about it. It's just God coming into life in real ways. Um, but as we always say too, he doesn't force his way in. And, and so what Paul is saying to the church at Philippi and, and what God the Spirit is saying to us through Paul is let the door be open. You know, let him in. Go ahead. This is an interesting translation, the Passion Translation. Mm -hmm. Paul says, For I'm trained in the secret of overcoming all things, whether in fullness or in hunger, and I find that the strength of Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. Okay, and a couple of words really jumped out from what you read there, Gwen. Uh, his explosive power and that, that word um, power uh, in the New Testament is literally the word from which we get the word dynamite. It is explosive. It's dynamos. Uh, and and the, it, it has power in itself is the idea. The word does. And then the other word that jumped off, for me at least, when you're reading that, is I have been trained. And what does training take? Practice. Practice, time, and effort, right? And, you know, we're in an instant everything culture. And practice, time, and effort don't always come easy for us, do they? But the things that matter in life, they usually take what? Practice, time, and effort whether it's a relationship with a friend or a spouse, whether it's doing the best you can in your workplace and dealing with other people who just like you are sinners, whether it's, you know, being, being a, a concert pianist, you know, whatever. It takes practice, time, and effort. And, and that idea of being trained, I think, is a really important concept here too. So let's pull that back, and we're, we're going to have to wrap up soon, but pull that back to what we were talking about that was the royal we there. What I was talking about at the beginning, um, that God is working to conform us into the image of Christ His Son, Romans 8. That's His goal for working all things together. He's training, isn't He? And do you know that God calls you then His masterpiece, His work of art? It is by grace you have been saved through faith, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. And this faith is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God so that no one can boast. Verse 10. For you are God's workmanship, his art piece, created in Christ Jesus, set free in him to do things God has prepared in advance for you to do. But that word workmanship, art piece, literally, that's helpful. You know, not just in the sense that it takes time and effort, but that God's investing himself in you then, isn't he? I don't have the talent to be an artist, but even if I had the talent, I'd struggle with having the patience to be an artist. I think you've got to have the joy of creating something and have the idea, the end idea in mind of what you're trying to create, to have joy to keep at it. That's what God has for you. He's got this idea of what he wants you and made you to be, and, and he's trying to move you in that direction, move me in that direction, right? His work of art. All right, uh, better keep going here. Verse 14, yet it was good of you, it was winsome is the word. And, and that's an, a good thought to keep in mind. It was winsome of you to share in my troubles. Why is winsome a good thing to add? Well, because that says it had an impact on Paul, right? It, it, it helped Paul understand God's goodness more clearly. Okay? Uh, and, and again, when we are living in ways that are 
where our sweet reasonableness is experienced by all. That's going to be winsome. That's going to be something that draws people. Uh, Moreover, going on in 15, as you Philippians know in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. Um, And there was those those collections that were taken from the churches in what we would think of as uh, Greece and around the Aegean Sea and Turkey for the people who were starving because of famine back in Palestine. And the Philippians really contributed to that. And, and you know, Paul made a, a big issue of taking that back and, and uh, letting the people at the mother church know what all the new Christians were doing to show their love and care for them. Uh, so the, the Philippians were, were blessed with being able to give in that way too. A sign of trust in the Lord. Uh, for even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. And it wasn't just for the people back in Palestine but for Paul as he's imprisoned as well. Uh, And we read about that in the previous chapter with Epaphroditus, or was that in chapter 2 probably, uh, and how they sent someone to help him when he was in prison too. So they were being a blessing, weren't they? Uh, Not that I am looking for a gift, now NIV has, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. Very literally, I am seeking the fruit that increases to your credit, that is, that that is an act of faith and therefore blesses you too, is what's behind that. You know, not being credited to your account as though God's going, two goods, one bad, one good, three bads, not that sense. It's not an accounting balance sheet, but that may be shown to express where your trust really lives, is the idea behind the the words that Paul's using there. Uh, so I'm looking for the fruit that, that shows who you are and then blesses you as well, is really what he's, he's getting at there. But what he's trying to avoid and what I'm trying to avoid is the motive that says, I'm going to do this because I want to get blessed. It's just what comes naturally out of you. And one of the natural outcomes is that you're looked after too. So that's what he's looking for, a life of faith. You know? You ever noticed how I can talk for five minutes and then one of you or sometimes even me will sum it all up in two words? Yeah, okay. Um, So the life of faith that says, I trust you, Lord, and it's going to be shown in how I live. Um, Verse 18, I've received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied. And, you know, he's in prison. He doesn't know if he's going to live or die when he says this. But he's thinking from an eternal perspective and pressing on toward that. Uh, Now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Why? Because they came from a heart of faith. You wanted to show me that, that I've been a blessing, that God still loves me, that you thank God for what he's done also through me, but all glory goes back to God. And so they're an expression of faith and a fragrant offering pleasing to him. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. You know, whatever's truly needful, it'll be supplied. To God, our, uh, sorry, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, this is who he is. Let's keep him at the center and let's honor him for who he is. It's kind of where Paul began and where his letter's wrapping up. Yeah, go ahead. Uh-oh. Paul mentioned a few times, especially in this uh, letter that uh, talked about my God, and my God shall do this, my God shall do that. Yeah. Why is he saying my God? Yeah, God? that's a good question. Not our God or your God, but my God. And, and I think my best response would be, and by the way, the translation is accurate. Uh, it is a possessive. Uh, so uh, my God is the appropriate translation in English. And I think my response would be in the context Paul's using his own life as an example. And they can see where Paul's life of faith has gotten him. Shipwrecked, stoned, imprisoned, beaten, whipped, and yet he's still willing to say, I'm content, my God is good. And so to say my God in that sense is to say, I guess I can say it this way, in spite of everything that I've experienced that to human eyes seems negative, my God's good. And, and so they can then take that 
idea and say, well, if that's true for Paul, okay, maybe that fits into my experiences too. It is a personal relationship between Paul and God and between you and God and me and God, right? So, yes, it's also true to say our God is good. That would be equally true. But I think the reason Paul uses the possessives here is to really use his own life as a specific example and say, look at what's happened. And just think about where the letter began. Uh, because of my chains, chapter 1, so many people have come to know Jesus. My God is good, is I think what's behind that. Yeah, go ahead. I think, too, it's a very intimate relationship yeah. that he's talking about. He's talking about the intimacy between him and this is my God. And there's that element of unity again then, right? And he's a Pharisee, he's so a, he's setting himself he's apart from the God. Pharisee's God. Okay. Okay, so for the people who are of that background that might read or hear this, yeah, Paul's a Pharisee and he's talking about this in such a personal connection to God. How can that be? So there's many, many reasons depending on the context and the hearers. But I, I would agree with everything I've heard around the table here. Uh, you know, it reflects that unity, that intimacy. It's a witness to others who wouldn't ever expect that kind of intimacy with God. And it's an example for the people who also are likely going to be suffering for their faith, that this is real. And it didn't shake Paul. Don't let it shake you. Um, and then finally, verse 21, greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings back to you. All the saints and, you know, saints, believers, right? Covered over with Jesus. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. And why would he make that reference there? I think it's because of just what our conversation was revolving around here, the personal example of how God's been at work through Paul's sufferings. Remember, he even wanted to share in the sufferings of Christ, and in some ways he's doing that in prison, right? In some ways, not nearly equal, but in some ways. And look at the result. My God has brought this out. And so he's emphasizing even those in Caesar's group, uh, in Caesar's household, have been brought to faith. Yeah, sure. So looking at it from that, when he made it so personal, their idea of what God would be, this had to be even strange to them when he made it on that personal level. Right. Not only for people who might be of a Pharisee background, but for the regular Greek person yeah. too, with all these different gods that you had to, you know, manipulate and connive to get their attention. And Paul's talking about my God who loves me like that? Yeah. And again, I think that's a, a great touch point for our culture as well, where a lot of people are, are thinking that there's something there. There's something. But as human beings, we typically, <clears throat> here come the air quotes, design God as kind of a more powerful version of us. And then he's never perfect, is he? And you're never sure you can trust him. And how much better for people to be able to see someone who says, my God is good. And especially when it comes from someone who's had great suffering in their life, um, to be able to say that with confidence. Well, and I think too, he could have related it to, when he says, my God, it's like, God corrects me. When you were talking about all the oh. things that happened, oh, yeah. so my God corrects me. He doesn't punish me. He's my father. He who is corrects. My God. It is so intimate and personal. And that's a huge difference too, right? It's not, it's correction. Yeah. He wants to get me back on track again because he is, like you said, my father who loves me. Yeah. And so finally, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And that's far, far more profound a statement than how are you, I am fine, or have a good day. <laughs> it's what is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, remember that, that acronym, grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. It's everything Jesus is which describes everything God is. Loving, kind, just, but he doesn't give us what we deserve from his justice. Instead, he bears it himself. So all of that be with your spirit so that you can keep the real God and the reality of who he is at the center, which is really what the book of Philippians is about. So that brings us to the end of Philippians, and we're at about 2 o'clock. Um, are you okay to go for 
you know, a couple of weeks or so yet through June? Is anybody, everybody's around? Okay, well, we'll carry on then next week. Maybe I'll surprise you. <laughs> no, we're going to try and do something. We'll try and do some things that we can finish before the summer break. So we're not, you know, trying to catch up again in the fall. Uh, but there's a couple of possibilities that I've got in mind. Uh, one of them is a very short book in the New Testament called Jude. It's one chapter. You ever, you ever study Jude? Yeah. And, and into that, I can pull one of the other things that, that we've been talking about today, and that's Romans 12 and, and what it is to live the kinds of things we're talking about today. So maybe we'll tackle that next time. Well, let's close there with prayer for today. And didn't want to cut anyone off. Anything else before we conclude? Okay. Lord God, we thank you for who you are. You are so good. You are powerful beyond our ability to fully comprehend. Yet you, who are totally other, who are totally above us, who, who created us, love us more than we can possibly imagine. Help us to live in that certainty. And give us a, a, a joy, a, a calm joy, a delight that comes from that, that will flow through us and uh, be reflected in us so that others can also see the kind of being that you are and that your love for them is also real. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. We pray your blessing upon this day, and we commend ourselves to your goodness and your care. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we'll go to Philemon next time, which is near the end of the New Testament. He is 
You and I are swimming in a culture full of opinions masquerading as wisdom. What's worse, much of what passes as wisdom today has the ring of biblical truth. There's a hint of biblical truth, but it's not complete. Sometimes what we hear is altogether wrong. So how do you tell the difference? How do we see through half-truths and self-help trends to access the deep wisdom of God's Word and the full life found in Him alone? These are the questions we're going to address in this series trite, not true. I want to explore the most common pop philosophies and superficial sayings that influence people's lives today, including Christians. Let's discover how to decipher and cut through the noise of our culture to hear the real truth of God's Word, and let's learn how to apply biblical wisdom to our everyday life. Because ultimately, the life full of wisdom and impact and influence doesn't come from a trite philosophy, platitude, a maxim, or a mantra, but from the one source of truth. Jesus Christ. Come rejoice now, O my soul, for His love is my reward. Fear is gone. 